So welcome today to today's workshop. We are our Ask a Specialist workshop. We're talking about communication milestones ages zero to three. A little bit about Las Cumbres. Las Cumbres has been serving the Los Alamos community for 50 years now. Um, our first office was actually in White Rock and, uh, and has since moved to, to Española and we're actually hoping to, to have a physical space up in Los Alamos sometime soon. Very exciting for us. Um, we actually serve all of Santa Fe County and Rio Riva County and Los Alamos County. Uh, we serve, we are a contractor for the state for early intervention services, for FIT services. Uh, we focus our uh, attention on kids who are zero to six um, but we do have some services that actually extend beyond that age. Um, happy to have anyone join us on our on our uh, workshops. Parents, uh, people who are you know professionals are welcome. Anyone who wants to join in, we will also be posting this recording to our website, and and we'll post that here as well, so people have access to it. Um, we're excited about the expansion in Los Alamos and expanding our services up there. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Abby Nelson. I live and work in Los Alamos. I am a parent of special needs kids who went through early intervention. Uh, with me today is Teal Radford. She's a speech and language pathologist. And we have been working together for five years now. And, and she's amazing. And I love working with her. And I'd like to turn the time over to her. And she's going to, what we're going to do today is we're going to go on a brief overview of um, the milestones that we'd like to see in speech development for a child. So what, you know, what's expected and the range that is considered typical and when to worry and when not to worry. And, and so we're gonna to touch on those. And if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat and we will address those at the end. Um, or if, you know, if it's applicable, we'll actually address it as we go. So Teal, take it away. Yes, and I want to mention that this presentation is specifically covering only ages birth to three. So we're looking at that um, smaller age range. I want to talk, uh, begin the talk by um, discussing why communication is important. Communication is what allows us to connect with other people in our lives. It's what lets us express ourselves, learn new information, share our thoughts and opinions, um, ask for what we want. So when a toddler isn't able to communicate some of these basic wants and needs, it can be really frustrating, not only for the um, toddler, but also for the parent. So um, Las Cumbres mission, my mission working for Las Cumbres is to um, help toddlers find a way to communicate so that that frustration is eased for the entire family. And at the end of this presentation today, um, I want everyone to be able to walk away knowing if their child or a child on their caseload is communicating at age level. I also wanna take a moment to describe the difference in some terminology that's often used interchangeably in our field. So I'm a speech language pathologist, and I don't think that most people know the difference um, between speech and language specifically. So um, I'm actually going to be defining communication, language, and speech. So I think about communication as the exchange, that like back and forth. Communication can be nonverbal, right? It could be a look. It could be sign language. Um, language, in contrast, is more of the how we're communicating. What words are we choosing um, and the concepts in our brain behind those words? And this is in contrast to speech, which is the uh, motor production aspect. So um, speech has to do with pronunciation, uh, articulation, and the sounds that we're using to speak out loud. So speech is something that we're not super worried about in the birth to three population, but we will touch on it just a little bit at the end. So here we have a little video to highlight um, the difference between these three concepts, communication, language, and speech. Let's have a look and talk about what we notice. Okay. <laughs> and there we go. Who needs to talk? Who needs to talk? You know what you want? <laughs> 
hot chocolate cake. Is it yummy? <laughs> so, Abby, is that baby communicating? This baby is communicating. This baby is telling the parent which item they want to eat. Um, this is actually my niece, and I got permission from my sister to share this. I think this is such a great example of nonverbal communication. And a child who is not frustrated, she's not frustrated at all because she's able to tell a parent what she wants and what she doesn't want just through sounds and physical motion. She was moving away. And then when they were presented her with something she did want, she ate it. That is such great communication. It, it's one of my favorite examples, especially because this little girl, my niece, was a little bit delayed in her are in her expressive language and the things that she was able to say. And so, and, and the reason being is she was able to communicate. There was no frustration on her part. She just made a noise and they knew what she wanted and what she didn't want. Great example of communication. We don't need words to communicate. We can use body language, facial expression, love it. So I wanted to talk a little bit, this little, I love this little diagram. It talks about sort of how we're building language, how this language is starting to build. And we want this base to be social skills. And that sounds, you know, silly when you're talking about that in terms of a baby. What do you mean building social skills with a baby? How do you do that? How do you build social skills with a baby? Well, we do it actually, um, if, you're, if you're a parent or if you've worked with small children, you do it and you don't even think about it. What do we do when we have a baby? We make eye contact, you smile at them, they smile back. That back and forth, that's a social interaction. You're, you know, you do things like you sing songs to them, you make silly noises, they make silly noises back. All that interaction is social. All that building, the holding, the hugging, all this is back and forth social interaction. And then you move on to things like receptive language skills. That's probably the next building block for language. Receptive language is what you're taking in and understanding. This is when a child starts understanding that mom is saying no, and they are crying because they want to go and play in the plug because they're boys and they want to be electrocuted. And, and that's just what happens. And so, but you know, when you're saying no to your child and, they, and they're pausing and they're looking at you, they might still do it, but that they're understanding, they're, re they're receiving that information and they're understanding it. They're understanding when you say, where's mama? And they're looking. They might not be saying mama yet, but they are understanding it. So they're understanding the words that they're doing. And the way that we as parents, and you probably don't even know you're doing this, the way we are cementing these words for children is by dialoguing our day, by saying things to them, by singing songs. These are things that we're already doing that are building this language, this receptive language. Expressive language is when kids are starting to use words or actions, we use you know, baby signs, or they're even using sounds to tell you when they are happy and when they are sad, and you will know. And a lot of times we are reading those expressive cues without even knowing it. And because you're responding to those cues as like, I know what they want because this, you know, they're doing this thing. And so they're expressing it. They might not be using those words yet, but they are telling you what they want. The last one is articulation. That's when they're saying the words, when, when you start worrying about things like um, using the appropriate sound where you know, kids will say spaghetti instead of spaghetti. And, and it's fine. We actually don't worry about articulation, specific articulation until they're over three. It's really not a huge concern. Um, we want that communication, that, that functional language is what we're looking for. And I love that term functional. It's those useful words um, that can, that are able to communicate ideas and to share those social skills, to share that social interaction, building on that. So that's what, so, and I know that like you see all the words and it's like, how does that apply to a baby? So I hope that sort of cleared things up. Yes, and <clears throat> I would point out that by the time many of our families refer their child to our services, the concern is already up here in expressive skills. Can you guys see this mouse? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but this diagram is really beautiful illustration to point out that in order to work on expressive skills, we need to make sure that these lower level or like foundational skills are in place first. So we can't really work on expressive 
we wouldn't expect a child to be talking if they're not already understanding those words. And we wouldn't expect a child to start talking if they're not really interested in interacting with us. So this really gives me as a therapist a foundation to understand where I need to start working and building skills with any child. So um, I'm going to start by describing some early social skills specifically. Social skills are something that honestly develop throughout our lifetime. I mean, we can continue to grow in our ability to interact well with others throughout our life. Um, and at their core, they really just highlight a child's interest in uh, watching another adult and trying to copy them or watching them and paying attention to them. Um, and, and that's also the core of communication, right? We need to be interested in other people in order to have a back and forth conversation. And that's what a lot of these skills reflect. So the first bullet point says reacts to people and events. Um, this is something really basic, like your baby noticing when you say their name, when you walk into the room, um, they're, they're paying attention to their environment, they're alert, they're interested. We also look at turn taking or something we call reciprocity, which is um, the back and forth. Again, this is kind of uh, an echo of the back and forth of communication. But for a baby, this is represented in play um, by maybe rolling a ball back and forth. Or I, I, I think I invented this game in my therapy where we take a cup, uh, two cups, the mom has a cup or the dad has a cup and the baby has a cup and you can dump a ball or dump some water back and forth. That's a really beautiful way to um, support this skill of turn taking. And, and even things like um, making noises back and forth, the silly noises, the blowing raspberries, the blowing kisses, all that back and forth play that you're doing that with kids, um, all of that builds that social interaction, that back and forth reciprocity. Yes. And we have mirror neurons, even as babies that allow us to watch our mom stick out her tongue and then baby does it too. That's uh, along the same vein. Uh, sharing focus with you on a toy. This is illustrated in the picture on the right. Um, even though this isn't a baby, I liked the illustration. So um, there's something called joint attention that we look at in speech therapy and early intervention, which just refers to um, the baby looking at an object and then looking at the parent, looking at the object and looking at the parent. So they're paying attention to what is happening with their toy. And they're also checking in with the parent or caregiver saying, what do you think about this? Is this okay? What's going on here? Are you smiling or are you scared? Um, so again, just showing interest in um, other people socially. We want to see that they're starting to explore their voice, vocalizing on purpose. And uh, I'll even skip ahead to the last bullet point, which says that they're um, trying to find a way to initiate an interaction. So this could either be by yelling. Um, a lot of times babies will just go, ah, when they want you to look at them or make some kind of noise. That initiation could also be a, a tap or a hit on the leg um, that they're interested in trying to get your attention. And then I would really highlight the second to last bullet point on here, imitates and copies you. This is one we kind of touched on a little bit. Um, and this is another skill that we need, like literally throughout our lifetime in school, we learn new skills by watching the teacher copying. Um, when we go to college, same thing. When we're in our jobs, we, we a lot of times learn by observing and emulating. So this requires um, attention span again on the adult and um, that the baby is interested in watching them and trying to do the same thing. These are our foundations for communication. If one of these skills is missing, um, I would say it's super important to work on building that skill up before we would expect to see um, your child trying to communicate a whole lot. Here's a video which is going to illustrate some of these skills. Um, so we'll watch the video and then I'll flip back to the first slide and we can kind of discuss which social skills we saw here. Where's my pretty girl? Can you say bye-bye? Can you wave bye-bye? Say bye-bye. Yeah, can you clap your hands? Ashna. Ashna. Yeah. Can you wiggle your butt in the air? Ashna, look at mama. Can you clap your hands?
Ashna, can you clap your hands? Can you clap your hands? Yay! Can you wave bye-bye? Ashna, wave bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Wave bye-bye. Wave bye-bye. Wave bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. You never wave. Where's bye -bye. my pretty girl? <laughs> um so, Abby, do you want to talk about some of the social skills that we could have observed? I love that example. It's one of my, like, I, I sit down and I, I want to, like, clap for her when she's going to say, yay, because it, it's just, you get so excited about kids when they're, like, doing, you know, mimicking. And clearly mom was doing, you know, a, an example for her and she was seeing it. And that back and forth was really cute. And it's really fun to see uh, that, you know, that, that learning and developing and they're thinking about it. And it's like, and she's also demonstrating and using the words at the same time, which also solidifies that understanding, but it's also the social back and forth, you know, joined to the, the attention. She, you know, she's looking at mom, mom's looking at baby, that back and forth is so great. And, and baby imitates and copies and does the things that she knows. So it's beautiful. Love that example. Smart little baby. Yeah, so cute. So now I'm going to start going through expressive and receptive milestones kind of in chunks um, by year. So I'm first going to talk about under a year old, then I'm going to cover milestones for one to two, and finally two to three, um, both receptive and expressive in each age range. I've included these little pictures um, for receptive. There's a little ear and expressive. There's a little chat bubbles to help you uh, be reminded of, of what area we're in. So I'm going to start with receptive language um, for babies that are under a year old. Here are some of our expectations for a typical baby. We want to see that they are responding and recognizing to their uh, recognizing their own name specifically. Um, there's kind of a universal gesture when we go to pick up a baby. Sometimes we'll reach out our arms um, and, and stop. And when babies start to, <laughs> thanks for the demo, Abby, <laughs> recognize what's about to happen, yeah, and reach up um, to meet us halfway. They're, they're understanding what that gesture means. We want to see that they are responding to um, prohibitory words like no or stop, and even interpreting the emotion in our voice, right, because those words sound different uh, acoustically than our typical speech. And usually we're saying them when a child is about to do something dangerous and you're telling them to stop so they, they can hear you know, and understand your emotion behind it and that, oh, mom's serious. She means it. This one's kind of interesting because almost every parent when this comes up says, well, are you talking about understanding or actually stopping? Because those are two different things. He understands, but he doesn't stop. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, fair point, but I think we can definitely um, notice it when there is a lot of emotion in that voice. Like we really mean it. Are they understanding? understanding that word. Uh, kids, uh, maybe by the time they're closer to one year old, should be able to start waving bye-bye, blowing kisses when we ask them, and especially like in that video when we're asking and showing them, um, wave bye-bye, blow kisses, blow kisses. Or you'll also play games like so big, and the kids raise up their hands in the air, oh you're so big, you know, all these little games that we play with kids is, is building that receptive language. Um, and even things like Where's daddy? Where's daddy? Finding daddy. Where's mommy? Where's mommy? Where's sister? Brother? All those things, those, those are building this receptive language as you're playing those games. Totally. Uh, yeah, and that covers our last two bullet points. Understanding names for like everyday objects, their favorite, um, maybe a word like bottle or passy, uh, mama, dada, names for siblings or grandparents. And then maybe around one year old, they might be able to point to one or two body parts when we ask them, where's your eye? Where's your nose? Those are usually the first two in my experience. So let's look at what, uh, what we would be looking at as far as expressive communication or what a baby under a year old would be trying to say or communicate. We want to see that they're using different sounds for different reasons. They have a happy sound, a mad sound, a hungry sound, a tired sound. Um, 
that they're using some gestures, functionally pointing um, or reaching towards something that they want, starting to wave bye-bye on their own when they see that somebody is leaving. Um, and then we start to hear their voice. Um, usually, um, well, actually I have some video examples that we'll watch next that kind of describe some of the levels of babbling. Um, but we definitely want to hear a noisy baby at this stage. We don't want them to be super quiet. Um, and they might start to- Sorry, you'll hear, you'll hear kids start to explore their voice. They're like, I've got these sounds I can make. And they start exploring it. And there's different levels of that exploration of that developing exploration of these sounds that they make. They might, and, and so Teal has some of these videos that really demonstrate, you know, what we're looking at in terms of, of you know, vocal development. It's, you know, just, I have this voice, it makes noise, I can do things with my mouth. And so it's, they're, they're just developing these sounds. Totally. That's the, that's the purpose of babbling. Like, what happens when I open my mouth and push air out? It sounds like, ah, what happens when I put my lips together and push air out? It sounds like, Pfft. so they're literally just exploring. That's the perfect word. Um, we might hear a mama or a dada not babbling, but actually applying to a real person. And then we expect first words by around 12 months or one year. So here is an adorable example of the first stage of babbling, which is called reduplicated babbling, where he's just repeating the same sound over and over. Let's have a listen. That is the first stage of babbling. Uh, it usually happens around six months old. Um, here's one of the things I love to do when, when kids are babbling, when they start that, when your child is starting to make those noises, make them back to them. And that, that builds on the expressive language, building in that social aspect of back and forth, making sounds to each other. Yeah. Carry on. Sorry. Here's the, thank you so much. Here's the <laughs> stage of babbling. This is called variegated babbling. It happens at around nine months old. So Really month to month, this is a, a pretty fast progression. In variegated babbling, we see all different kinds of consonant sounds and vowel sounds. The, the video cracks me up because I'm like, oh yeah, we went through like three different like good night moon books to say like <laughs> destroy them. <laughs> but love the sounds that she's making. But yeah, like my kids like went through like three of those books. <laughs> yes. So babbling is getting more complex and some first words. Um, now we're moving into the next language um, age group. So we're looking at one to two years. I realize these are kind of big chunks um, to cover. So I'm gonna try to describe whether something is kind of closer to one or two years. Um, so looking first at receptive language or what they're understanding, um, between one and two years, they should start to be able to identify a few more body parts. Um, and alongside that, identify a few more like household objects, um, maybe pointing to some familiar people and pictures. Um, we want them to be able to follow simple, what we call one-step directions during play and also during their daily routines. Um, let's maybe give some examples of like a one-step direction during play might be, um, I always go to like put the ball on your head. What were you going to say, Abby? Well, I was just saying that, you know, things, things like, uh, especially things that are part of routines are really great for this receptive language because it all it doesn't necessarily happen just through words, but it happens through gestures as well. Like you, after changing a diaper, you might hand the child the diaper and say, go put it in the trash. And that builds that receptive language that there is an action 
and then they hear the words and then they, they, but they also know it's part of a routine. So this is building that receptive language. Um, and then, you know, you wanna like shake it up a little and test their receptive language and see if they're really understanding. And that's why I love you, like, like you said to like things like put the book on your head because it's something that's so out of a routine. It's not part of something that they normally do. Um, and, and, they, it's, and it's a fun game to do with kids and they think it's silly and it's fun. And because all of, I feel like all development should happen through play and through fun. Uh, that's when I think you see the most development is when you're playing with your child. And so that's a great, um, I love how you're saying like doing, you know, the unexpected, those unexpected uh, words. Yes. Yeah, we can use really expected things like in routines, like you said, go get your shoes because we're getting ready to go, <clears throat> go throw this in the trash because it's trash and that's where it goes. Those are more obvious. Yeah, and then working up to some um, surprises or, you know, silly requests, silly directions. And I always use um, the phrase to remember the best way to work on helping kids follow these one-step directions, remember, um, tell them, show them, help them. So tell them is our verbal only cue when we say, go get your shoes. And we're not pointing and we're not looking at the shoes. Show them is when we're pointing and giving them a pretty solid clue what we're asking them to do. And help them is when we take the little hand and walk them over and help them pick up the shoes or pick up the shoes ourselves and put them in their hand and then, um, they've completed the task. So um, I love like that, like the, the, the building, you know, those, the, the building blocks of, of getting that, that language for them. It helps them. Um, the last bullet point is, is saying that they are more interested in this age at paying attention to books and able to point to pictures when we are looking in a book and asking, where's the doggy? Where's the house? So I love that, especially with the books, like just that you don't have to, you know, people say, oh, you should read to your child. Sure, read to your child. But honestly, even just opening up a book, pointing to pictures and saying, dog, cat, cow, they, that is reading to your child because they're seeing a picture and they're identifying it with a word and all of that. And so as after you're doing that, then you say, where's the, where's the dog? Where's the cow? All of that is building that language for kids. So that, and they'll have, so between that one to two years, they'll have that, they'll build that attention span to be able to do that. Mm, definitely. Yeah. I don't like reading <clears throat> sentences in a book to a toddler. I always like pointing and labeling. Okay. So expressive language milestones for the same age group, one to two years, they should be imitating a lot of words, um, even just spontaneously all on their own. Um, they're going to start to jargon at around 12 to 15 months. And we have the most adorable example of what jargon sounds like if you're not familiar with this term. Um, it's kind of like an advanced form of babbling or even maybe a bridge between babbling and speaking in sentences. At this age, they'll maybe start to try to sing along to their favorite songs. They're not, we're not expecting them to get all the words in there just right, but they're trying and the melody definitely helps. Um, asking to have some needs met. This is what Abby was talking about when she brought up functional language. Can they ask for water when they're thirsty? Can they ask for more? Can they tell you all done when they want to get out of their high chair? These are like their power words. Can they tell you what they need? And this is such a sticking point for so many of our little clients because they um, don't yet have those words to ask for what they want and it can be so frustrating. Yeah, there's a difference between that functional language and language. So kids might be able to identify or even name and, and uh, name a whole bunch of things and label them, which is amazing building blocks for language. But if it's not functional language and there's no communication, we're not going to reduce that stress and that anxiety and, and the frustration that kids are having because they need to be able to use those words that are meeting their needs. So it could be... Um, you know, you know, water, it could be, one of my favorite ones is no, no is a great functional word, up, that's a great functional word, because they're telling you they want to be lifted up, um, help, 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 because, you know, if they would need something opened, or something, you know, put in, or a puzzle, they need, you know, they're always, they'll just bring it to you, right, and, and so, 
you know, using those words help. Those are all great functional words. And those are the words we really want to concentrate on as we're building language. Not that the labeling isn't great because everything builds their ability to, you know, create this, uh, what am I, vocabulary, this vocabulary that they are going to use functionally later. So no language is bad. Like, you know, well, I mean, there is bad language, don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying that, you know, the any words they use or that they're learning is going to be functional later. But the, the initial functional words are important. That's true. That is very true. Um, we mostly expect them to only be using one word at a time to communicate here. Um, and then I have some vocab milestones for you guys. Um, we look for maybe like 50 words um, at 18 months. And around the 50 word uh, milestone is when we start to see kids combining words. So they'll use two really familiar words that are already in their vocab. A lot of times it's like, hi, Dada, bye, Mama, more, please. Um, combining two words that they're already using. And we don't, uh, yeah, we start to see that when they have around 50 vocab words that they're saying independently without hearing us say it first. And then on the further end of this age range, closer to two years, um, a typical toddler has around 200 vocab words and they're using lots of two word phrases. Uh, I'll say that by the time a toddler has 200 vocab words, I think the vocab list has gone out the window. We're not able to keep track anymore is another way to uh, think about that number. <laughs> or at least I can't keep track. The, the typical parent can't keep track um, by the time they're two years old. It's a lot of words. Here's the example of um, jargon that I mentioned. So uh, yeah, this is a really complex form of babbling that actually a lot of parents describe it as their baby sounds like they're speaking a foreign language. It has all the up and down intonation. Uh, and the look on this baby's face, it looks like he knows exactly what he's trying to say, but we just don't perceive any words that we understand. Okay. They need to work on that, right? Yes, okay. Did you understand it though? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, no, not, not this one. This is the grand finale of this. Okay. Yeah, that's the last one. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, don't bring that in. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah. yeah. Like, go somewhere else with that, but don't break here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I said. He was like, ah, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? But don't do it here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Really? I thought the same thing. <laughs> we think a lot alike, huh? example especially because there's so much back and forth it's the social aspect the child is mimicking those intonations the the inflection that happens during language it's another building block and it's so cute yes and we look for jargon to emerge between 12 and 15 months and actually if it persists past um two and a half years is when we might uh that can be a red flag so if you have a kid who's um, older than two and a half approaching three and they're still using a lot of jargon without a lot of words that you can understand, that might be a good uh, indicator to check it out a little bit. And I love this, this list that you have here, Teal, of the, the, some great early words, some great words that kids, you know, and these are things that kids, you know, a lot of times it's, it, it's things they're interested in. You might you might have a kid who's focused more on, you know, cars or animals or dinosaurs or trains, and that's where their words come in because it's really going to follow their interests. That's true of, you know, anybody. They want to learn, you know, and communicate about what they're interested in. Yeah. So, and you'll see things like you know, pointing to birds, pointing to trees, 
And, and they want you, and they want to do that back and forth again, that social aspect of it, a back and forth. So I really like this, uh, this, you know, common first words, the uh uh-oh, the hello or hi or bye, all those like social words come in. And then, and it's also functional, like mine, mine is very functional. (laughs) That's right. It's how we avoid getting in trouble for hitting our sister. (laughs) And this um, vocab list is actually research-based. So it was compiled, um, it's compiled by a researcher named uh, Leslie Altman Rescorla. And she um, compiled this list from research at the university that she works at. So these are actual common first words. I just thought this would be nice um, to kind of have as a reference if you're thinking about what words to introduce to your child when you're trying to get them to imitate or talk. And this will be available through um, a link that will be on the website after our presentation today. And I think there's actually a link in the chat for it as well. Perfect. Here's a a graph um, for vocab norms. These are um, numbers that I actually already mentioned mostly as we were going, but I kind of like this illustration. Um, We really see, I mean, to me, it just stands out because this language growth happens so fast. We go from our first word at, at a year, 12 months, by the time they're 18, that's, you know, 50 times greater. And then between the span of 18 to 24 months or one and a half to two years old, that's like quadrupled or even more. So we're really looking for kids to have a, a you know, new words every, every week. And I don't, and I, and I know it's hard as a parent, you don't want to get bogged down in numbers. You don't want to get bogged down and, oh my gosh, my kid's supposed to have these many numbers, this, these many words, and it doesn't have that many words. And there's no need to get, as, as long as your child is making progress and they are communicating, you want to see, what we want to see is a steady amount of progress. If you have a kid who is stalled um, and, and for a while and hasn't built that vocabulary, then you want to say, maybe we should, you know, talk to your pediatrician, call Las Cubras. Um, these, so uh, those are when we, we might need to bring in a speech and language pathologist. So, but I don't want to, like, I know it's easy to see these and, and panic, but you're getting, well, I need to start counting how many words my kids have, you know, it's okay. As long as they're making consistent progress, that's what we want to see. And, and, and I just don't want parents to panic because I know as a parent myself, we worry all the time. Yes, very true. There's, there's definitely some flexibility with these numbers. And a lot of times um, me and Abby see that kids who are super interested in um, gross motor, they're a child that likes to climb and run and jump. Um, usually we or sometimes we see um, kind of like an inverse relationship. Those kids are just interested in moving their bodies and they're not really paying attention to this delicate process of learning how to use their mouth. So there's definitely some some flexibility in um, what would be appropriate, but this is just a little. Yeah. I always joke, I was like, I always say, you know, sometimes you have that kid who is like, I my interest lies in, you know, running and jumping and getting places and getting into things and destroying things. And that's where their focus is. And they're going to concentrate on that because it's of more interest to them. And then you have kids who are more interested in, in talking and communicating. And there is a stage when, when kids hit this wall and they start getting frustrated, what people call the terrible twos. It's, it's not terrible. I actually get very excited when kids hit that frustration wall, because that's when we see that big leap in language is when they start getting frustrated. If you have a kid who's not frustrated and they are, they're fine, you know, that that's when you want to start saying, you know, say please, or say, you know, encourage it and, and sort of nudge it along a little bit. We, you know, we don't want to like stress kids out. But. And I, Sorry uh, to go backwards, but I want to say one other thing about the previous slide, which is I want to point out what's not on this list. We don't see ABCs. We don't see colors. We don't see numbers. Those are academic skills. Those are not um, words that are going to help your your baby or your toddler get their needs met. Um, so I always encourage parents not to focus or, or really think about colors, numbers, and letters. Uh, really prior to three or maybe as they're approaching three, unless that's their intrinsic interest. Okay, guys, we're in the final section. Um, We're gonna look at some skills for receptive and expressive language in the two to three year range.
So starting with receptive language or listening, we would like a two-year-old to be able to follow two-step related directions. Um, and I'll give an example of what related means. If you looked on at this last bullet point, we get to unrelated directions closer to age three. Um, related directions are just two things that naturally go together, like um, go get your cup and take a drink. Those two things kind of naturally um, happen one after the other. So um, closer to two, we want them following two-step related directions. Closer to three, we'd like them following two-step unrelated directions. Those are exactly what you would expect, something um, in a sequence. So something like stop hitting the dog and go get your shoes. So they have to kind of keep the second command in mind as they're carrying out the first command. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and, 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 that's, and, and the nice thing is, is you can just sort of see if your kid can do that by trying it. It's really like, are they doing this? I don't know. Let's try. Yep. Um, they, they are going to like to have the pictures in books labeled like Abby was describing, um, just listening to you point and label pictures or a lot of kids like to be the one pointing and they want you to just name the same thing on the same page a thousand times. That's really good for the receptive language, I'm sorry to say. And singing songs with action. Songs with actions is one of my favorite recommendations I give to parents because things like head, shoulders, knees, and toes, um, itsy bitsy spider, I hate to even say it, baby shark. Baby shark is a great one because it has the hand, you know, motions and it gets kids moving and they get excited about it. And if you're like me and you don't want to, you know, sing a song 5 million times because a kid is interested in it, you will get no judgment from me if you show them a video. It's fine because all of that is the same, you know, re repetition. Repetition is really what solidifies things for kids. Listening and singing to music in the car or at home, or, you know, when you put a kid to bed at night and you're singing a song or you're uh, reading the same book that has the same words in it, that's all that stuff is building this language. You're building this, um, the space for language for kids. Yes, and babies' brains um, crave repetition. If you haven't noticed, that's why they like to hear the same song and read the same book and hear the same, the same rhyme at the same time and the same pace because they're learning from it. So if they're requesting repetition, that tells me that they are learning from that repetition. So you got to do it. <laughs> they should um, also at this age start to understand some early pronouns like me and you, your turn, my turn. Even if they don't like taking turns, they should under understand what those concepts are. Um, understanding some early descriptive words like hot, stinky, um, sticky, messy. Yeah all of those adjectives. And the um, great part about this is, is like, it's all, it might be things you're doing already. All this stuff is, is play. All of this stuff is fun. They're starting to interact and they'll start to interact with their, their peers and siblings. And, and they're doing this back and forth sounds, words, all of this is building this language for kids. Um, okay. So this is our final um, slide related to milestones. We're looking at what a, a toddler between two and three years should be able to say or sign or express. So we want them using lots of two word phrases. Um, closer to three years old, we'd start to see some three word phrases. Um, I always remember one word at one year old, two word phrases at two years old, three word phrases at three years old, roughly. Um, it's kind of an easy way to remember that sequence. Um, they should be starting to tell little stories about events that just happened. Like if dad trips on a rug, <clears throat> they might say dad, dad fell down, that they can kind of put together um, a sentence to describe something that just happened. They will start asking and answering open-ended questions like where's dad, dad or what's that? Um, this is getting a little technical using plurals um, and using the ing and ed verb endings, but this is just to point out that they're starting to understand some um, grammar and sentence syntax, like how we change words depending on the sentence that we're using it in. And they're not going to use it correctly at first, which makes all those cute, you have all those cute little toddler things, you know, say, you know, dad go to store, you know, they're going to say, you know, add the ed where it's in, inappropriate, where, it does, where it's technically not correct. And, 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 you know, and those are the really cute parts about this, you know, this area of development is they're going to use it wrong, but they know, but they're understanding that, you know, that's a past tense and I'm going to add it onto this word. And so it's, it's all great building for language.
And that I would say these um, endings, like the plural, the ing and ed, are definitely closer to the uh, later end of the two to three year range. And then finally, um, they'll start to be able to say their own name and then express some some descriptive words that describe how they're feeling. So they're um, able to kind of describe their internal state. I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. I'm hot. Such great communication words. Oh, yeah. So this is the top of our pyramid. Um, I said that we don't really pay too much at attention to articulation and we don't. Um, the more important thing is that kids are trying to say words and we would only start working on articulation when all of the language milestones are age appropriate. Um, but there are what were um, what are called the early eight sounds. And these are consonant sounds that we would expect kids to be able to pronounce correctly in the beginnings of words. So it's really common for kids to leave the endings off. Um, like ka instead of car. I'm okay with that um, under three years old. But I like to see these words being used and pronounced correctly at the beginning of words by the time they're three. Okay, so I really wouldn't start to even look at this until they're like two and a half or two and three quarters. Um, so M like mama, B like bottle, P like papa, W, you know, water. Um, N if they're saying no, D for dog, H for horse, wife. Uh, for like, yes. So you can kind of do a little mental checklist and think, um, or even ask your child to say some of these words. And early articulation mistakes are very common as they're, as they're exploring words, because for them, the, the exact specifics of how a word is pronounced isn't as important to them as getting across what they want to say. And so they just want to say the things and it's going to be funny and you're going to get words like biscotti and you're going to get, and, and we even have like, you know, fun words that my kids said when they were little and that were silly that we've incorporated as they're older and it's funny and we still remember them because they're just funny silly articulation mistakes and uh, like my son said cat farmers instead of transformers still to this day hilarious and so but so i always tell parents don't worry so much about the articulation um you know under age three like that's not it's not as as concerning however if there are concerns about articulation um, after age three, they can they can qualify for services through the school district. It's a little bit more technical. They can qualify, and they they can qualify based on articulation if there is an articulation issue that is significant enough that they do need uh, to continue with speech therapy. Um, so, I mean, articulation does can become a concern, but we don't worry so much about it as much as we worry about functional language and um, and building that. Uh, you know, the ability to make sounds and noises and communicate. So, but the, the specifics, they do address that later as kids get older. So we might not deal with that at the zero to three population, but they, but it is something that can be a concern if it is an ongoing issue. Yes. If you are interested in some additional resources in this area, um, one of my favorite, favorite um, early intervention speech language pathologists is named Laura Mize. She has a YouTube channel, she has a website, she has a podcast. Um, she, her YouTube videos, um, I think she does a therapy, therapy tip of the week where she takes a toy, any toy, and every week she describes how to use it to um, teach a variety of different uh, language goals, whatever you're working on with your child. It's an awesome resource. And if you liked listening to me talk about <laughs> communication development, I actually have my own YouTube channel and Facebook page, which is called Coco and Teal. Um, you can find it on, on YouTube or Facebook. And I've created some really short videos that describe a variety of topics related to early intervention speech therapy. Um. If you have any other questions about your child's development or a child that you're working with, uh, if you ever have any you know, questions about speech development, you can uh, call Las Cumbres Community Services or go to our website and make a referral. You do not need a doctor to make a referral for services. We're always happy to evaluate children ages zero to three and to, to see how that development is going and make recommendations for families. We do provide uh, speech therapy, uh, occupational therapy and physical therapy and feeding. And we do have relationships with the School for the Deaf and New Mexico School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So we have all these uh, relationships and we are we get very excited about helping families and to navigate those, those early years.
Um, there's on our website, you can see a link to our virtual, this, this uh, workshop will be recorded and put on our, our website to add to our library. You can find that at lascumbres-nm.org virtual-groups.workshops. There's little places to click on there. Our next um, coming workshop that we have, our workshop that's coming up is with Patty Delgado, who is an occupational therapist. And she's going to be working on fine motor skills in young children. And so we're, that's what we're going to talk about um, during that workshop. So, and also in our, um, in our chat box, there will be a, a link for a survey. So you can tell people, tell us how we did and how, um, how we can make these workshops better and more accessible and, and answer any questions you might have. If you do have any questions, um, please, uh, you can, uh, they, we're happy to have you give you our email address and you can email us if you don't feel comfortable talking in a, this kind of a forum totally fine. You can always call us and, and they can refer your questions to us specifically. Um, I know that uh, we had a question at the beginning today about um, children that are learning more than one language. And I want to address that since we have the time or a little bit of time anyway. Um, this is actually the next topic for my, um, my next Coco and Teal video. So I have a resource that I can email to anybody who would like this little written um, blurb. I kind of tried to condense it down to something pretty um, concise. Um, what we know about bilingualism and learning more than one language at a young age is um, babies' brains are obviously, or maybe not obviously, I shouldn't say that, babies' brain, brains are primed to be open to learning more than one language. Um, their brain is more flexible than an adult brain is. So if you want your baby to be really proficient in more than one language, now is an ideal time to do so. Um, there's a lot of reasons why parents want to have a bilingual baby. Usually it has to do with the cultural affiliation of the family, right? So we want them to be able to communicate with their family members. Um, it leads to increased career opportunities, cultural awareness. When babies know one language, really well. Um, it's easier to learn additional languages in the future. And then there are all kinds of these cognitive benefits that have been studied, like increased ability to think flexibly, increased ability to focus. Um, I think they even studied it in relation to Alzheimer's disease and seen that it um, kind of pushes off an onset of Alzheimer's. So it's really, really awesome. I'm a big um, proponent of teaching your baby more than one language if you have the ability um, There's but, also, um, like people wonder, you know, is my child going to be speech delayed because I'm introducing two language, two languages? And I would say yes and no. Uh, sometimes there is a little bit because they're working on so much, right? So you'll see a little bit of a delay, but it's not significant. It's not something I, I worry about because a lot of parents, say, oh, I don't want to introduce two languages because, because they're not going to be, you know, they're going to be speech delayed. Nope, not necessarily. Actually, um, I have... Um, Several families that I know where the uh, the mom and and dad both speak different languages to the children, and they do fine. Um, you know, one one of my friends that uh, the the child doesn't think their dad speaks English. He does, but he only speaks Spanish to them. So they they think he only speaks Spanish because that's how he communicates with them. And they, as a result, have learned both Spanish and English. And has that speech been a little delayed overall? globally a little bit, but not significantly enough that it's, you know, prohibitive. You don't want to say, oh, I don't want to, you know, introduce two languages because of, you know, I don't want them to be delayed in speech. It's really not significant. The benefits outweigh the, the, the cost, I guess you could say. And we do know that babies spend a little bit longer in that receptive phase. So their, their expressive speech, their talking is likely we can prepare parents that that expressive language is going to be a little bit later. They're going to spend a little bit longer listening and figuring out what the difference is between these two languages. Um, it does sometimes result in a small delay in language um, compared to like babies that are only hearing one. But if it's important for your baby to understand more than one link, and I think it's important to leave the decision up to parents. I just want them to make an informed decision and understand that there is maybe a small temporary delay um, over time that that delay 
resolves, you know, as they, as they get a better handle on language. But I think what's super challenging is when, um, when the baby isn't using either language. So if the pair, if the baby's feeling or the toddler's getting really frustrated, the parent's getting really frustrated because baby's not able to communicate anything it might be something worth a conversation to say, okay, let's teach them how to ask for water and how to tell you that they're hungry in one language. And then we're gonna go back and layer in the second language. I mean, it, it's very case dependent, but we do probably expect a slight delay. So that answers that. Thank you for coming everyone. This has been a really great workshop. Thank you, everybody.